Happy Sabbath. Two of the most misused words in the English language would have to be, trust me. Have you heard it? Politicians ask us to trust them. We hear some salespeople and even some of our friends say, trust me. Perhaps you and I have said it too. I like what that great philosopher, Yogi Bear, said. Don't trust people who say, trust me, because trustworthy people never waste time saying it. They just go ahead and do what they've promised. Trustworthiness is a very honourable attribute. And no other place is it more honourable than in the marriage relationship. For those of us who are married, are we trustworthy? Married couples need to be able to trust each other to have a happy and stable marriage. Can friends and workmates trust our word? Can God trust us? I believe that the amount or proportion of trust and faith in God is reflected or demonstrated by our personal trustworthiness. There are many promises in the Bible. On every page, through stories and parables, God says, trust me. Remember Noah, who was told to build a, a boat when it had never rained. God said, trust me, Noah, you're going to need it as a way of escape. And we know what happened. God told Moses at the Red Sea, trust me, Moses, put your feet in the water and a dry path will appear before you. And it surely did. There are promises where God says, acknowledge, acknowledge me, trust me, and I will direct your life. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And millions of Christians can testify that God always keeps his word. There is a promise that I appreciate very much in 1 Corinthians 10, and it says, God is faithful and can be trusted not to let you be tempted and tried beyond your ability and power to endure. But with the temptation, he will always provide the way out that you may be capable and strong enough to bear it. We can trust him in the darkness for the promises he gives us in the light. May God help us to be trustworthy and reliable people for his glory. It has been my privilege the last uh, two days to call people right across this country and to thank them for their magnificent support of the campaign in Russia. It's a wonderful thing to know how many people are praying for this work. And I want to send my greetings right across Canada, down to the Caribbean, and right across this great land of the United States of America. Uh, three weeks ago, I was speaking one night to a great crowd of Russians. Many atheists were in the audience, or at least ex-atheists, ex-communists. And I had presented to those people strong evidences why a person should step out of the darkness of unbelief and step into the light of God's Word and believe that there's a personal Creator God. Now I wanted to tell those people what God was like, what sort of person was He, and how can a person be saved? How can a person come into a saving relationship with this Creator God? I thought of various ways I could try to do this. I wanted to talk on salvation, and I wondered whether I should give a talk on justification by faith, and use some of these great important terms that are used by Paul in the book of Romans. But as I talked, as I thought before I talked, as I prayed about it, the idea came into my mind to talk to them from some of the parables of Jesus. And I want to share with you today three of the great parables of Jesus. Some years ago, 
I shared these great parables. I'm going to share them again today with some new insights. And these stories tell us what God is like. They describe the heart of God. I want you to turn, please, to Luke chapter 15 and notice the words of Jesus or the words of the Bible about Jesus. Luke chapter 15. Three great stories that tell us what the heart of God is like, what God is like. Luke chapter 15, and I want you to notice verse 1 and onwards. The Bible says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. This is going to be the theme of the talk, that this man, the Holy Son of God, eats with sinners and he welcomes them. When it says here the tax collectors, it refers to those people who collected taxes for the hated Roman government. Therefore, they were not loved by most people, except, I guess, by their wives and their children. And the Bible says here a very interesting term. It says, the sinners were there. But of course, everybody here recognizes the truth that every person is a sinner. You are a sinner, and I am a sinner. But the Bible says the sinners were there because it is using the terminology that was used by the Pharisees who were respectable sinners. And when it says the sinners were there, it is referring to people who were unrespectable sinners. People like Mary Magdalene who was a prostitute and the publicans the people who were the tax collectors. So the Bible here talks about sinners and sinners. There are sinners who go to church and who preach sermons and who hold office, and they are respectable sinners. But when the Bible says the sinners were there, it is talking about people who walk around Hollywood, if you understand what I mean. And it says that the Pharisees were muttering in their beards. The Pharisees were very, very good at some things, and one thing they were very good at was criticizing other people. They were professional criticizers, and they did a lot of muttering in their long beards. Let me say a word about the Pharisees. The Pharisees really go back to the days of the great tyrant Antiochus Epiphanes. Around 200 years before Jesus, a wicked man whom the Jews still consider today to be the Antichrist, a Syrian king came against the Jews, went right into the very Jewish temple and offered a swine upon the altar. They called him the Antichrist. And undoubtedly, he was a type of the greater Antichrist who was to come. And there were some people who were very zealous Jews who withstood what Antiochus Epiphanes was doing. And uh, those people were the Maccabees. There was a very courageous Jewish man whose name was Judas Maccabeus, and he fought Antiochus Epiphanes and actually defeated him. And there were some people who surrounded the Maccabees and they became known as the pious ones. And as the years rolled by, even the pious ones became contaminated by the worldliness of the Hellenists. And the Hellenists were a group of Greeks who tried to bring the Greek religion into the Jewish religion. And there arose the very best of the best, a group of people who said that we will defend the the truth of God to our last drop of blood, and they became known as the separated ones. They were the defenders of orthodoxy, the faithful of the faithful, the defenders of the faith. They were the strict 
keepers of the law. They were Adventists inasmuch as they looked forward to the advent of the Messiah. And an Adventist is any person who believes in the advent of Christ or the coming of Christ. And they were Sabbatarians. They believed in the keeping of the Holy Sabbath of God. And they became distraught by the worldliness in the church. And they devised literally hundreds of different laws whereby if a person kept them, surely he would be faithful in keeping Sabbath. They were very, very strict in giving of their tithes and their offerings because these people wanted to please the God of heaven. So earnest were they that they embraced what is called by theologians the doctrine of sinless perfectionism. The doctrine of sinless perfectionism says it is possible, yes, it is necessary that a person attain to sinlessness before God will accept him. And so they strove to be the very best in everything and to keep the law of God perfectly. In fact, they taught, and this was the official teaching of the Pharisees, that when the day came when all Israel would keep the law of God perfectly, just for one day, the glorious advent would come, and therefore they believed that the advent of the Christ was delayed because Israel was not faithful in keeping the law of God. They were earnest, and they were good people. They also believed in the doctrine of triumphalism. Because of their study of the prophecies of the Bible, they believed that the children of Israel were the elect of God, and they were the remnant church of God, and that nothing could stop the triumph of the church of God. And they said, the church will certainly triumph because God has said so. So they believed in the doctrine of triumphalism. Their understanding of sin, I believe, was remiss. They had a superficial view of sin because they believed that sin consisted only in doing. As a good man wrote to me just a few days ago after listening to one of my sermons, he said, I do not believe you understand what sin is, my brother. A swimmer is a person who swims. A jogger is a person who jogs. And a sinner is a person who sins. Of course, that is exactly what the Pharisees taught, that sin was what you did. But the Bible teaches sin is far more than what you do. It is often what you don't do. And sin is often the attitude that lives in the heart. But they had the religion of do, 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 cock-a-doodle, do. And they believed that righteousness was what you did. That righteousness consisted in right doing. And righteousness was the doing of many righteous acts. Therefore, they had what we call the checklist religion. I have done this and this and this and this and this, and they could check it off, and they came at the bottom of the page, and it was 100%. Therefore, their religion was the religion of righteousness by works. They had as you can imagine, very little spiritual security. One of their famous rabbis said, when I die, do not bury me in black robes, because he said, I may just wake up with the righteous and be embarrassed. And he said, do not bury me in white, because I may wake up with the evil and be embarrassed. Bury me in neutral gray. They had no sense of eternal security, and yet they were super critics. They despised others, and they were always putting down other people because they had to lift themselves up. Super critics, super zealous defenders of the law of God, hungry for power, the church 
politicians that sought to have a job in a position of power. As they thought power was, they believed also that the end justifies the means. And therefore, one of their groups said, it is better for one man to die than for the whole nation to perish. They believed that if the greater glory of God was at stake, you could do what you wanted to do as long as the end was good. They were very popular with the people they were respected by the common people because of their courage. They were not cowards. They were strong. They would give their lives for the cause of God. They were respected because of their courage and their zeal. They were not numerous, but they were influential. They were the greatest religionists that the world has ever, ever seen. I tell you, they were the greatest religionists the world has ever seen, and they crucified God. And so on this occasion, when people were gathering around Jesus, they were muttering in their beards, this man eats with sinners. This man receives sinners. Jesus agreed with the Pharisees on many important doctrines. Jesus kept the Sabbath. Jesus taught the principle of tithing. Jesus taught the coming of the kingdom of God. But there was one doctrine that separated Jesus from the Pharisees, and that was the doctrine of the love of God. And so when they said, this man receives sinners and goes and eats with them, Jesus said, guilty. And then Jesus told three stories to show that the Pharisees, on this point at least, were right. Please notice them. Luke chapter 15 and uh, verses 1 and onwards. Luke chapter 15 and verse 1 and onwards. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners, receives sinners, and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. He told three. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. For years I could not understand who the 99 persons were who did not need to repent. Because the Bible says every person must repent. But Jesus here is talking about people who felt no need for repentance and they were the religious people called the Pharisees because they felt that they were attaining to the righteousness of God, they felt no compulsion to repent. But Jesus, in the story of the lost sheep, is painting a picture of the love of God, because it is he who, himself who goes after the one lost sheep, why was this sheep lost? In the next parable, the parable of the lost coin, the coin is lost through no fault of its own, we will see. A coin can't lose itself, but a sheep can lose itself. And for some reason, this foolish sheep wandered away from the sheepfold, which is the church of the living God where the people of God come together to worship. 
but the Bible paints a picture of God who goes through the ragged ravine with bleeding feet, and when he finds the one lost silly sheep, he doesn't kick it, he kisses it. And the Bible says he lays it on his shoulder near to his heart, and when he gets home, he says, let us have a party and let us celebrate because the sheep that was lost is found. Dare I remind you and every person on watching on television that Jesus often went to parties and he spoke about parties because in the scriptures a party and a celebration is symbolic of the gospel because the gospel is the, is the Greek word that says good news. And when a person comes to know Christ, it is no longer doom and gloom, it is joy and peace and holy celebration. Let me tell you, dear folks, something. Over in Nizhny Novgorod, from which we have just come, our music was different because when you listen to the choirs of the Orthodox Church, it's enough to make you cry. Everything is in a minor key. It is sad. Even our own church choir sang for us one night when they were through. I felt like weeping because they sang for us a beautiful Russian Orthodox hymn. But our music was different. I said to Paul Mickelson and to Norm Matiko and to our singers, we will have no minor key songs. We will have everything in the major key because the gospel is not minor key. It is the song of celebration and happiness and joy. Amen. And so when the sheep comes home, the shepherd who is God himself, he says, it is time to rejoice. It is time to celebrate because the sheep that was lost is found again. Now we come to the second parable, the second story. Verse 8. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What is the difference here? This is a coin. The coin is not lost in a field. It is not lost because of its own foolishness and its own stupidity. It is lost because of the carelessness of the housekeeper. And this house in which this coin is lost, I think is the house of God. I think it is the church of God. Many people are lost in the church of God, not through their own foolishness or carelessness, but because of the housekeeper or keepers. And so here is a person lost in the house of God. And the woman, whom I imagine symbolizes the church, lights a candle. And she searches diligently. This is a description of the work of the church to search for the lost coin in her midst. So she lights a candle and she, she searches diligently and when she finds the coin that is lost under the accumulated dust, then she calls the neighbors in and she says again, rejoice with me, this is a time of joy because I have found that which was lost. This tells me, my dearly beloved friend, 
that one person lost in the house of God is a treasure for whom we should exert the greatest expenditure and effort. What is Jesus telling us in this? He is telling us that people are more important than buildings or anything else in the world. Jesus here is teaching that everything depends upon a soul. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? In these words, Jesus tells us that one soul is of more value than all the gold or all the silver in the world. Now we come to the third story, which I think is the best. Verse 11, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. This is the story that has been called by some theologians and great preachers the story of the three prodigals. I want to tell it to you. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me. He is the first prodigal. We will see that the second prodigal is God, the father. And the third prodigal is the Pharisee. He tells a story because it illustrates the problem of the Pharisee. And so the younger boy, the prodigal son, he says, Father, give me. That's the cry of the selfish, carnal, lost heart. Give me. What can the church give me? I don't get enough from my church. What do you give to your church? You hear the cry in the world, give me. At the time of the elections, the man who gives the most is elected. Give me. Will I have more health benefits? Give me. Not what will happen to the people 50 years from now if time should last, or even 10 years, people say, give me. This is the idea of the welfare state and socialism and Marxism as it exists in America. Give me. Give me more benefits. Give me a government that will give me more. The cry of the carnal heart, give me. It is the cry of the slave. Give me. John Kennedy, years ago, said, Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask, what can I do for my country? I say to you, ask not what can my church do for me, but ask, what can I do for my church and the world? Oh, it is a cry of sorrow. It is a cry of depravity. It is a cry of slavery. Give me, said the prodigal son. Don't say it, friend. Rise above being a prodigal. Don't say, give me. Say, what can I give for my God? There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set out for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth. The Bible says, in wild, in prodigal living. That means abundant, extravagant, over and beyond, more and more. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country. He began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Mark this well, that the way of give me is the way to the pig pen. Did you hear this? 
The way of give me is the way to the pig pen. And the way of sin, my friend, is the sin that goes down, leads down. And this give me boy, the prodigal boy, wasted his money. No sense of responsibility. He wasted his money. His brother said he wasted it on harlots. Of that we are not sure. Because the Pharisees often told lies and were always critical of others. And so whether he wasted his money on women or not, he wasted his money. And when his money ran out, so did his friends. So here is a boy, the give me boy, and he gives everything in riotous living. And the day comes when this joy, Jewish boy, not a joyous boy, but this Jewish boy, who was brought up to believe it was a sin even to touch a pig, is now living with the pigs. I tell you, beware of the sin that leads down. And here is this boy who gets so hungry because there comes a famine in the land and he is so hungry that he wants to eat the pig food but his master is so mean that he can't even get some pig food to put into his shrinking stomach. So he is the first prodigal. But the Bible says... There's another prodigal, and he's thinking of his boy. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, have you, have you, have you and I, we come to our senses? The Bible says, that before we get back to the Father's house, we've got to come to our senses, and there's got to be an awakening. And the Holy Spirit is speaking on this boy's heart. I ask you, is he talking to your heart? Is he speaking to you today? The Spirit of God is in the church. He's lighting a candle. He's sweeping the house. Is he talking to you today? Are you listening to him? When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. This is the great awakening. And this in scripture is called repentance. Sometimes, my friend, and it's a sad thing to say, but sometimes we have to hit rock bottom before we want to go to the Father's house. Sometimes we've got to be hungry. We've got to be down in a pig pen. And we've got to feel that the world has fallen apart before we come to our senses. Sometimes we have to go low before God can lift us up. I say to you, don't wait until you're in the pig pen. Don't wait until you're in the pig pen. But the Bible says, he came to himself, and he said, I'll go back to my father's house. Verse 20 says, so he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. I want you to imagine the sight. Here is the boy. He's lived with the pigs, maybe for months, maybe for years. And the filth of the pigs is upon him. The manure is in his garments. You can sense his coming before you see him. He is perfumed all over. 
and he gets up and he goes to his father's house, but his father has been looking down the road. What does that tell you about God? The Pharisees were looking down their nose. The Pharisees spent their times looking down their long noses. But God was looking down the road. And so here comes the boy, and his shoes are worn out, and he's filthy, and he stinks, and his father runs out, and he doesn't rebuke him, and curse him, and say, you're a disgrace to our home, but the father puts his arms around that smelly boy, and hugs him to his bosom, and kisses him. That's what God is like. That's something the Pharisees couldn't understand. How God could welcome into his fold a Mary Magdalene, a prostitute, a publican, an out and out sinner, stinking, smelling. I have had the privilege on two or three occasions of going to the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, the most beautiful city in the world, and seeing the great, I think it's a Rembrandt. Did you see it when you were there last? The greatest painting in the Hermitage, the prodigal son. I think it is a Rembrandt. Did you see it? There it is. I wish I could describe it to you. I think it's one of the greatest paintings in the world. There is the old father, and I'm sure it's a Rembrandt because of the chiaroscuro, the arrangement of light and shade. There is the old father. He has a long nose. Pardon for my Jewish friends, but there he is with a long nose, and he's bent over, and he's gazing down upon this boy, and you can only see the back of the boy, and one shoe on and one shoe off, and the clothes are filthy, and he has his hands on his boy's shoulders, and if you look into the face, you see the face beaming with kindness and compassion. Standing in the background, standing a little like this, is a rather superior individual, who is the elder of the church, who is not outright scorning, but he stands with his head up, looking at this offensive father and this offensive boy, and you say, why do you call the father a prodigal? Because a prodigal means abundant, extravagant, wasteful, and so is the father a prodigal with his love over and beyond. Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. He is pouring his love over this boy. Also in the background, there is a fool who is gazing at the scene with laughter on his lips, who is oblivious to this great truth that the boy has come home. It's a great painting. Read on in the story, dear hearts. Thank you. (coughs) Please read on. Verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He doesn't finish the speech. But the father said to the servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Oh, this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now listen to me carefully. Listen to me carefully. This is one of the greatest stories in the world, and it teaches great theological truths. Get the scene. Here is this filthy, give me 
waster. Don't spend a lot of your sympathy on him because he does not deserve commendation for his actions. But that's not the point of the story. Who here deserves commendation for his actions? But here he is in the filth of his sin. And when the boy comes to the father in sorrow, the father says, put a robe on him, covers up the filth. That's called justification by faith. The sinner is declared righteous. I told the Russians, you may not understand a lot of theology, but you can understand a dirty boy being covered up with a robe. And then he says, put a, a ring, a ring, put a ring on his finger. The ring of sonship. You belong to me. Put sandals on his feet. And the rest of the story is such that I am almost afraid to tell it unto you. Because here was a father who obviously wasn't on the pretty can diet as I am. Because he says, bring the fatted calf. And they bring in the calf and they slay the calf. And there's lots of laughing and I will not even repeat the other words. There's lots of laughing and there's lots of rejoicing. And you say, but that doesn't sound like my pastor. That doesn't sound like my church. But these verses tell us what God is like. That tells us what God is like. You say, then we are a long way from God. Maybe we should come to the Father's house and have a robe put around us. Can you imagine how the Pharisees felt about these stories? They hated Jesus not because he was a Sabbath keeper, because they were, not because he taught tithing, not because of his doctrine of the kingdom of God. They hated him because he said, God has got so much love and so much compassion that even when you stink of the pigsty, there's room for you in the Father's house. Yeah. Now, how does that make me feel? I'll tell you how it makes me feel, and I'll confess it to you. It makes me feel that there's hope for me. There's hope for me. And maybe you will feel the same way, that there's hope for you. Now we're going to talk about the third prodigal in this story. Please read on with me. So they began to celebrate... Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. Why was he in the field? Because he was working. He was no shirker. He was a worker. Mm, I would have got on with him. The older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and that other stuff. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Now you think the older brother would have rushed in there and said, welcome home, brother. You've been missed. But the older son is a Pharisee and a prodigal. You know why he's a prodigal? Well, read on, you'll find out why. Verse 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. That's the grace of the father. Goes out to this boy who's so mean and nasty. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Why do I say he's a prodigal? Because he's a prodigal in his meanness. A prodigal in his cold-heartedness. And he sums up his religion. He says, all these years I've been slaving. 
maybe there are some prodigals here, like the older brother, and all these years you've been slaving. You say, I've been slaving to keep the commandments. I've been slaving to go to church. I've been slaving so hard I have never broken your commandments. This is the doctrine of perfectionism. And in the chest of that boy, there is a heart that is as cold as ice and as hard as a rock because he is the righteous member of the family and lost and damned and on his way to hell. All these years I've been slaving for you. I never broke your commands, as one theologian says. He never slept with the prostitutes. Certainly not. He was too mean for that. It wasn't because he was not consumed by passion, but because of his innate selfishness. He was a worker, not a shirker, but could not understand the super overflowing abundance of the heart of God towards the stumbling, repentant sinner. So read on, please. And here Jesus gives us the punchline. Read on a little further. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders. That's self-righteousness talking. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son... The father said, you are always with me. Everything I had is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. I want you to think very carefully about this third prodigal. His problem was he felt he had no need. When you study about the church of Laodicea, which is the last church, that church says, I have need of nothing. It's the same problem. Contrast the apostle Paul who called himself the chief of sinners, who said in Romans 7, O oh, wretched man that I am. And because of this, Laodicea has a tendency to be harsh and hard and loveless and unforgiving. And that religion has never won a soul to Christ. As one person said, that religion is as sunny as a sob. Sunny as a sob. That is the religion of the Pharisee. And I want to remind every person here today that only the person who has received forgiveness can give forgiveness. And the boy out in the field had never received forgiveness because he felt no need of forgiveness. But I would like to remind the Pharisee who was watching and the Pharisee who is here today that there's mercy even for the Pharisee. Jesus saved some Pharisees, not many, but he did save some. And perhaps today in the church, there's a lost sheep. You're lost and you know it. There's a lost coin. You're lost but you don't know it. And maybe a lost boy who is living with the pigs. But the father's heart is warm to you today. I want you to know this today, that the shepherd is looking today for the lost sheep.
The woman has lit the lamp and is searching, and the father is still looking down the road. And a message for the self-righteous, the father has left the banquet and is now even pleading with the elder brother, whoever you are, there's mercy and grace for you today. 